hello everyone the webinar will start shortly we're just waiting for everybody to come in it always takes a bit of time um goodness good good to see so many people here Good, people still pouring in, excellent. Yep, the will start in just a moment, just waiting for people to come in. That's great. So I think we can make a start now. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Louise Pryor. I'm president of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third event in our thought leadership webinar series, which we're calling The Road to Glasgow. And this one, uh, the series focuses on sustainability issues. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this series, our platinum sponsor Milliman and our sponsor Star Actuarial Futures. Their support is very welcome. This series forms part of the IFOA's 2021 Thought Leadership Programme, and we're convening leading experts, thinkers and decision makers with our global membership to debate the key sustainability issues of our time, which intersect both actuarial work and the interests of wider society. We're hosting this webinar series throughout the, the autumn ahead of COP26 in Glasgow, and I'm thrilled to be chairing it during my presidential year at what is a critical moment for climate action. Through the series, we're providing a platform for prominent contributors so that our members and others can understand the perspectives of a wide range of parties interested in the climate debate. We're drawing on the expertise of a diverse range of experts from within academia, the financial sector, and our own thought leadership community around the world. Um, it's, it's really a fantastic series, and I'm pleased that so many of you have joined us today. All events in this series are free to attend. Do look on the events page on the IFOA's website for details of all the forthcoming events. So today we're focusing on net zero. The IFOA supports the aim of the Paris Agreement to limit climate change to an increase of substantially under two degrees from pre-industrial temperatures. And we also recognize that in order for there to be a reasonable probability of achieving this aim, there must be a transition to a global economy that has no net greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. This is a hugely ambitious target. But as a profession specializing in risk management, we recognize that climate change is one of the greatest risks facing our world today, and that mitigating the risk is urgent, which is why we're taking a number of steps to support um, our members, the profession, and to support the ongoing um, net zero target worldwide through the financial system. Um, so we have set out a climate change statement, which we published earlier this year. Um, we're taking action as an organization, um, both to support our members and by developing and implementing a plan for us as an organization to be net zero, operationally net zero by 2030. We join obviously a number of other organizations in doing this. A lot of governments around the world have set net zero targets, most for, with the aim of 2050. However, there's been little legislation to achieve these targets. There are a lot of corporates who are also um, setting quite ambitious targets for net zero, but there is a danger that many of this is fine words, but is not backed up by substantive action. 
The Paris Climate Agreement applies to all greenhouse gas, gas emissions, but participating countries didn't decide how emissions are to be reduced, nor how reductions would be measured. So agreement on these issues are uh, big priorities for the Glasgow summit. Um, but there has been an information vacuum during the six years between the Paris Agreement and now. So there's now multiple interpretations and options floating around. Through this panel session, we'll explore the different levers that can be used to meet net zero targets, including climate science and data, government engagement and mobilizing green finance. Our expert panel will also debate just how realistic these targets are and whether they're ambitious enough. And we'll also be thinking about how the actuarial skill set can be used to assist progress. So we've got three fantastic speakers today. Emily Shukra, Director of Cambridge Zero, which is the University of Cambridge's major climate change initiative. Emily's a reader in environmental data science at the Department of Computer computer science and technology at Cambridge and leads the UKRI Centre for Doctoral Training on the application of AI to the study of environmental risks. She's a mathematician and climate scientist and has acted as an advisor to the UK government on behalf of the Natural Environment Research Council. In 2016, she was awarded an OBE for services to science and the public communication of science. Rebecca Willis is professor in practice at Lancaster Environment Center, where she leads the Climate Citizens Project. In 2020, she was an expert lead for Climate Assembly UK, the Citizens Assembly established by the UK Parliament. Becky is a trustee of the New Economics Foundation and an advisor to the National Lottery's Climate Action Fund. She was vice chair of the UK Sustainable Development Commission, advising the prime minister and first ministers of the devolved administrations from 2004 to 2011. And Marion Elliott, um, who is an actuary, is global head of pensions at GFG Alliance. Um, where she also leads on ESG, bringing together environmental, social and governance initiatives across the various businesses and jurisdictions in which they operate. Marion was formerly a managing director at Reddington. She holds a non-executive director position and is a member of the IFOA's pensions board and is a past member of the IFOA's council. Welcome to you all. How we're going to do this is that each of our panelists is going to make some short opening remarks. We're then going to have a panel discussion and then we'll start taking questions from the floor. You can submit questions at any time through the Q&A function in Zoom and we'll pick them up either in the discussion as we go along or in the question and answer session at the end. So do please submit questions as they occur to you. So I'll hand over to Emily first, followed by Becky and then Marion. So over to you, Emily. Well, thank you very much, Louise, and it's a pleasure to speak to you all today. Um, so I'm just going to outline um, some of the thinking that, that we've been undertaking around um, this, uh, this challenge of reaching net zero. But I want to, to emphasize that it's not just about net zero. It's about creating a climate resilient net zero um, future. So this is just as much about adaptation and risk management as it is about um, mitigation. And we need to think of those uh, the, the, each of those issues um, collectively and holistically. So I thought I'd start off just by by outlining the latest thinking that's coming out of the of the science in terms of the scale of the risks, um, because that is something that's very much evolving and um, becoming ever more comprehensive in terms of our understanding. Obviously, over the summer, the uh, latest uh, IPCC report came out um, articulating um, the latest thinking in terms of the science. And I wanted to emphasize in particular three aspects of, of the risk. Um, our increasing understanding of the risk of extreme weather um, generated by climate change. Key conclusion of the IPCC report was that we're now seeing the impacts of climate change in terms of extreme weather in every region of the world. But where there's um, a significant uh, advance in terms of the, of the scientific understanding is understanding how um, those uh, 
uh, weather related risks then cascade through our global societies, global supply chains, interact with other um, related risks and are starting to unpick and understand those cascading risks and really the, um, the, the significant um, increase in, in risk that you get as a consequence of the correlations between those risks is something that's uh, cri clearly critically important at the forefront of research at the moment. And uh, the third area of risks um, is the risk of passing tipping points, the risk that we know exists of really catastrophic shocks occurring as a consequence of the collapse of the vast ice sheets covering Greenland and um, Antarctica or the shutting off of the overturning circulation in the, in the Atlantic, things that we know that have happened in the past and there are early indications of um, some of those uh, tipping points potentially being um, passed in the future. And that translates through in the in the TCFD framework into physical transition and, and liability risks. But on each of those, when you fully understand that broader range of climate related risks, then you can start to understand where we may be underestimating some of those risks. So let me take um, transition risks, uh, for example, when you start to think through um, some of the um, cascading risks, then the fact that some of those can induce um, potentially um, issues in terms of social co cohesion or, or, or indeed about mobility migration um, ends up, you know, potentially through, if, you, if we're looking at a disorderly transition, um, then you can start to see how you might be able to get increased risks as a consequence of some of those cascading um, related risks. Or another example is, um, is in terms of greenhouse gas removal technologies or indeed other geoengineering solutions. If some of those um, are put into effect without the proper governance structure, then that in itself could cause an additional um, risk. So there are many, I think, currently emerging and relatively unquantified risk that we need to be considering. If we now turn to what we need to be putting in place in order to um, achieve net zero, um, we've been doing a lot of work in Cambridge thinking about that and um, I've started to consolidate around the idea that there are five I's that are really important, which are investment, infrastructure, innovation, institutions and information. So just very briefly to say something on each of those in terms of investment, there are multiple dimensions to the investment piece. Some of it is about what can we put in place to unlock private finance. That's clearly going to be absolutely critical. Um, some of it is about investment in skills and what we need to be putting in place to invest in, in the training and skills for the jobs of the future. Um, and, and more broadly, on the investment side of things, um, I think there's a there's a real focus in terms of um, investments about how do we shift the entire economy greener rather than you know what's sometimes just a focused on on, on the brown um, investment side in terms of infrastructure a key um a key uh, aspect is um how do we start to think in a much more systems way about infrastructure and greening infrastructure that involves collaboration collaboration is a key theme i think across each of these areas in terms of innovation what can we be doing to to further stimulate research and development and the key innovations that are going to be needed for um, a green future. But in particular, how do we ensure that there's a pipeline without any valleys of death in it, um, all the way from the university style research and innovation out into real world deployment and scale up? Um, and again, collaboration, critical to that. How do we put in place um, collaboration? How do we look to, um, it, it, um, support innovation in terms of business models, um, new ways of doing things. Um, in terms of institutions, what actually institutions do we need to put in place in order to support all that, um, whether that's institutions to help support on the <coughs> unlocking private finance and, and, and helping to support that aspect of it, or is it about in new institutions to ensure and enable collaboration across and between different sectors, ensuring that we have a joined up um, strategy um, from national government all the way down to local government and spreading out um, internationally as well. And then finally, on the information side of things, um, clearly all of this needs to be um, informed and, and, and rooted in at the evidence base. Just um, one area of research that I'm personally and have heavily involved in is how we can bring AI and digital technologies um, to bear to help provide better information to, to inform this. We're doing a lot of work, for example, on the um, 
better quantifying climate related risks uh, at a much more granular level, bringing in AI technologies in order to do that. Um, that's just one example of, of very many um, where there are significant advances that are happening, but there are also things that need to be put in place to unlock that, um, making sure that that data is openly available um, and interoperable. There are their own investment and institutional structures that are needed to um, support that. So there's a, I hope a bit of a whistle stop overview of some of the things that uh, we're thinking about on the Cambridge side. Thanks, that's great. And I think what came out for me is just the breadth of what's needed, that you can't attack it sort of one small piece at a time. Everything interacts with each other. And I think I, your, your um, five eyes are, are absolutely brilliant. And I shall certainly think about those in future, but also collaboration, sort of no one person, no one group of people can do this. We all have to interact and collaborate with others, which is fantastic. So uh, Becky. Thank you. Um, well, uh, um, Emily's set up what I want to say really nicely, um, partly because she um, started with sort of acknowledging the state that we're in, um, both in terms of the immense challenge of a fast and far reaching um, decarbonisation that's needed. And you will probably all have seen the charts for that. They sort of basically the, 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 the down, the, uh, the, 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 uh, slope of the downhill trajectory that we need to be on in terms of carbon reduction is absolutely dizzying. And of course, we'll be doing all this at a time when our climate is changing fast and in unpredictable ways. And so what this makes me think is that um, we are drastically underestimating um, the, 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 the change that's upon us. So I, I really like the phrase um, that I've, I've, I've nicked from the economist, uh, Jeff Mann, who's, who's done more than anyone, I think, to actually think through the political implications, the political economy, if you like, of a climate impacted world. And he has this phrase, uh, which he levels at economists, the irrationality of rational expectations. So the economists amongst you will know that, that economics is, is, is based on a, on a concept of rational expectations, um, that you know, people, um, people assume rationality elsewhere, and they also um, assume that the economy and almost by extension uh, society and our political institutions and so on um, are in a sort of, tend to return to a sort of state of equilibrium, technically a sort of general equilibrium. Um, so this launches into a sort of more generalised assumption that things will carry on sort of broadly as they are, an idea of the eternal present, um, and that shocks to our economy or society, like COVID, will happen, there'll be a shock, but there'll be a gradual sort of return to that equilibrium. And I think that this, these, these rational expectations, so-called, are really alive and well in debates about climate and energy as well. Um, put really crudely, the assumption that I think lots and lots of people are working to is that we can keep things just as they are, only without the carbon. And that people's lives won't change very much, um, that people might not even need to be very much involved in this transition. It will just sort of, you know, it's just sort of up to government and some businesses to beaver away in the background to ensure that we can keep on keeping on. So it's this, I, th I think that these um, supposedly rational expectations give us a very narrow horizon of possibility. And I think that does us a disservice because, you know, obviously I don't need to tell an audience like this that things aren't going to stay the same, are they? Um, you know, uh, pandemics, economic shocks, climate impacts. I think that we are now investing a huge amount in an, in an illusory stability and certainty. And 
I I don't say this to sort of pile on the 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 the, the doom and gloom. I actually say this because I think it's quite freeing once you once you think in those terms because it opens up the possibility space. I think that what we need to do is take a sort of collective deep breath and see what the world looks like if we abandon the irrationality of rational expectations. So I want to say three things that fall out of that if we do, you know, if, if we do take that moment to think, how is the world actually changing? I'm going to pull out three things that, 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 that fall out for me, although the list could be a lot longer. Um, the first is that because we're at a point of huge transition, there's lots and lots of ambiguity and inconsistently swirling around um, in our laws, which I'll go on to talk about, but also in our culture. Essentially, we've got this sort of, you know, we, we've, we're, we are sticking with our old carbon ways and laws at the same time as acknowledging that, um, you know, we need to get to net zero and that means big changes. Um, so a specific example of this that I've been involved in is the um, proposal for a new coal mine in, in West Cumbria near me. Um, it, a lot of people in the climate community say, you know, how on earth can you even put forward a proposal for a, a, a new coal mine? Isn't it contrary to, you know, the Climate Change Act, the Paris Agreement and so on? Well, yes, it almost certainly is. But it's not necessarily, and this is what the legal argument about is about, it's not necessarily um, in conflict with um, planning law or with the expectations of people in the fossil fuel industry. And so this came out in the discussion, the public inquiry about the mine, which has just finished, in this sort of arcane but actually very illuminating discussion about the difference between a forecast and a scenario. So they, the, the, um, the barrister for the mine was very keen to say that uh that they were producing forecasts which was essentially you know based on industry knowledge how much coal will be needed in steel making over the next sort of 10 or 20 years and he was really really critical of the um the groups opposing the mine um who said who, who, who were using scenarios like the international energy agency scenario like the climate change committee scenario because he said or their case was that they um, started from net zero and worked backwards to, his, had to see how that could be done. And they were basically saying that that was, you know, unrealistic or that it wasn't based on evidence because it was doing that sort of working back thing. And, um, you know, there's so much that could be said about that, but under cross-examination, and yes, I did watch a lot of the inquiry, um, it, was, it was live on YouTube, um, uh, under cross-examination, the people responsible for those forecasts, it seemed that what they were doing was betting on us not reaching our um, net zero target and on countries not reaching their Paris commitment. Well, you know, you might, whether or not that's a good bet, there's a there's a, a strong degree of um, uh, th th there's there's a, 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 a strong degree of if those are the assumptions and those are the expectations, well, of course we won't meet our targets, and you know that's the difference between um, you know economics or or the social sciences and physics, isn't it? That you know predictions are a part of how we generate our idea of what's happening in the future and they are material in um, the outcomes that we achieve you know things to put it crudely things become a self-fulfilling prophecy um, so that's first my first point the sort of ambiguity and inconsistency um, the second one and falling out of that directly is is what the role of companies is in this and you know, I, I think that more than ever, there's a case for um, companies to work with government in particular to actively shape the future that they want to see. And I've seen this um, very, I've seen this in my work with the energy industry. Um, essentially, all the, uh, the innovation and excitement in energy is not necessarily around, you know, how we generate it, but it's about how we store it, um, demand response, which is how we use electricity more cleverly to, um, 
to uh, smooth out uh, supply and demand. Um, and a lot of, um, I was interested in Emily's last points because a lot of um, ICT energy uh, um, interaction where we basically do th manage to do things a lot more smartly. And, you know, the current fuel crisis is, is an absolute example of why we should be doing more of this. Those innovative businesses are not well served by current regulatory structures, um, by the way that the energy market is um, currently regulated by government. And there's a big question about how those innovative businesses can get get their access to government, can get their message across, and conversely, how incumbent companies who uh, might not be benefiting from the transition, um, but who tend to be very well established within government, how those companies can um, give way. And lastly, and closest to my heart, because it's the focus of my research at the moment, um, I think it's really important to not forget about people. So my research process at the Climate Citizens Project at Lancaster is on essentially the relationship between the citizen and the state on climate change. And historically, as I said at the beginning, there's been a big temptation, particularly on the part of, of politicians, and you see it in this government all the time, to sort of say to people, oh, don't worry your pretty little heads about climate change. We will sort it, you know, don't worry about um, whether or not you can fly because, we, you know, we, we, we're going to invent a... Um, invent an electric plane um you know we'll we'll let you carry on your lives and we'll sort it all out for you well that doesn't actually wash because when you uh, do the kind of research i do like uh, climate assembly uk which ran last year and when you actually talk to people um, about these issues they absolutely understand the scale of the climate challenge concerns about climate are absolutely sky high but at the same time levels of trust in government are pretty low and there's not a lot of trust in government to do the right thing so this just leave it to us we'll sort it for you narrative is deeply unhelpful because people see the discrepancy between the emergency or crisis um, framing words being attached to climate change and um, the discrepancy between that and the lack of attention to what we as a society as social actors should be doing um, so, you know, those are those are just three areas in which as illustrations of, um, you know, what what we might start to the, the debates we might start to have if we abandon the irrational irrationality of rational expectations, um, if we really open up that possibility space and start to look at how we can, um, you know, the, 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 the more you throw up in the air, the more options there are, aren't there, for um, doing things differently, the more you accept that this is, uh, you know, very much a societal transition as well as a, uh, as well as a technical or technocratic transition. Um, to my mind, that is a much more enabling and hopeful place to start. So I'll leave it there, but really interested in, in, um, in the discussion. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, th that, that was great. And it actually picks up on a point that was made in our webinar yesterday that a, lot, a number of people in a number of um, established um, companies in particular appear to be planning on the basis or hoping that if we do nothing, everything's just going to carry on as we are now. And the point is that it's not. Either we do something to achieve transition, in which case things are going to change, or we don't, in which case things are going to change because of, of because climate, basically. So the option of doing nothing and just carrying on with, as we are is, is really not there. And, and to see people planning on that basis, I find um, uh, problematic, to say the least. Sorry, um, just 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 getting quite worked up about that there. Anyway, um, Marion, over to you. Maybe you can calm me down a bit. Oh, I don't know, Louise. I'll give it a go. Um, so I think, look, Becky and Emily have done a really good job, I think, of outlining just how broad and complicated and interlinked this whole thorny problem of net zero really is. Um, and it's one that I've seen being tackled from a couple of different vantage points. So spent some time working with institutional investors, thinking about how they manage ESG risks and opportunities. Um, I'm a trustee of a large hybrid pension scheme. So again, thinking through the risks and opportunities as, a, as an institutional investor. 
um, but now also working in-house as a sustainability lead for a major CO2 emitter. Um, and because of that, I could probably spend a whole day on this topic. So I'll try and keep it down to, to five minutes and focus on three areas. I think Becky and I probably went to the same talk on um, how to do public speaking and you, you've got to do three things. So um, my three things are practicality, time and people. Um, so practicality, I think we all need to be quite honest and clear about what net zero actually means and, and what it entails. And it doesn't mean that there will be no emissions or that overnight industries are going to abandon traditional practices. So even where we are successful in implementing new technologies to achieve close to zero emissions, there is still going to be residual carbon from industrial operations. And that means to deal with that, we're going to have to deploy carbon capture technologies. And as Emily mentioned, there are going to be all sorts of risks and governance considerations associated with that. So that, that's a piece that we shouldn't forget. It's not just that we're gonna get rid of any carbon emissions and, and that'll be the end of the story. Um, I think it's also very important from an investor perspective to understand the practicalities associated with any company's plan to achieve net zero. So as you said at the beginning, Louise, we've got all of these uh, shiny, promises and pledges but what are the practical steps that are actually going to be taken to achieve that and within those pledges what are the intended uses of offsets or carbon capture how practical are the reductions being promised does the technology exist to achieve those today and therefore how realistic are they so i think just getting under the skin of some of that is really important from an investor perspective because now more than ever it's easy to get the wool pulled over your eyes on that front um in terms of time uh, and I'm, I think Emily and, and Becky have made it really clear as well, to limit warming to one and a half degrees, we're gonna have to cut emissions by 50% this decade. To, and then we're gonna have to reach carbon neutral by 2050. So when you think about what that actually means, by 2030, we're going to have to see entire value chains committing to and transitioning towards net zero. Um, and, and associated with that are going to be all the systems that you need to actually properly track progress against these commitments. And that comes back to the data point that, that Emily was making. So this really is the critical decade. Um, and I, then I don't think I'm going to be calming you down, Louise, because doing nothing really isn't an option. We've, we've got this decade. When you think about the investment cycle, so I'm learning, um, having recently entered the, the steel industry, the length of the investment cycles means that you know if you take a, a steel manufacturing as an example a blast furnace needs relining every 20 years at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars so there really are only one or two investment cycles remaining to put in technologies that are going to be compatible with net zero trajectories and avoid stranded assets um, but new technology is expensive so again if, if i think about my industry making steel using near zero emissions is going to be probably 55% more expensive than conventional steel making in the 2020s. Now that differential will come down over time, but in the short term, no one's going to embark on those projects without policy and value chain collaboration. And that's where I think that the point around collaboration is so important. We just aren't going to get there unless we can all work together to make this feasible. So initiatives which focus greater flows of capital towards those companies that really do align with the net zero pathway is going to be key to accelerating the shift that's needed, but also as importantly is investment in accompanying infrastructure. So back to the, the energy point, um, we're not gonna get there without all the infrastructure aligning behind it. And then finally, uh, a similar point to Becky on people, but I think looking at people from a slightly different perspective. So as we transition to this low carbon economy, the implementation of new technologies and retiring carbon intensive processes are going to have a huge impact on the communities in which heavy emitting industries operate. And that's something we're spending a lot of time thinking about at the moment. Um, there aren't any easy answers. It's a really complex problem around how you manage the human impact of the transition to net zero. So we're gonna see a change in skills required in the industry. There's gonna be much lower manpower requirements in the new technology, um, more expensive end products potentially as a green premium gets applied during the transition. So as we engage with companies from an investor perspective around net zero plans, I think it's also really important to be cognizant of the S in ESG and how that transition is likely to impact on the people and communities associated with those companies. 
So as well as just understanding the carbon reduction plans, we should also seek to understand what plans are in place to assess and mitigate the human impact. And that is it for me. Thank you, Marion. Um, so again, I think you're emphasizing the, the breadth of the change that's needed. It's, you, you, it's, it's going to be very difficult to pick things off one by one um, and, and the need for collaboration. And I think this people point is very important, both sort of within um, individual societies. So, so in Britain, it, it's obviously, you know, the, the sort of people in heavy industry and everything, but also globally, um, we know that the physical impacts of climate change are not going to hit equally but also the transitional impacts are not going to hit equally either. And we, we have to think about how we can share the benefits that accrue to us all um, by achieving net zero, if we do manage to achieve it, and how we can, um, you know, this is the whole concept of a just transition, that we have to share the benefits and make sure that we don't leave people behind. We haven't actually so far, and this is interesting, none of you have really talked very precisely about net zero. We've, we've sort of had it as a vague concept up there and it's clearly important. Do we think that net zero, that, that the targets people are setting, are they ambitious enough? And on the other side of the coin, are they actually realistic? Um, I, I suspect that we might say that they're neither ambitious nor realistic, which is, is a bit of a problem. Um, oh, I don't know which order to go in. Emily, first, you can go first on this. Uh, OK, thank you. Um, so I think, well, what, are we doing three points and everything? I think it seems to be the tradition so far. <laughs> um, and I'm sure I can do three points on net zero. Um, so I think the first, first, my first point on net zero is that it's not an end point. Um, so um, Marion rightly, uh, you know, outlined the pathway of needing to halve emissions this decade globally, reach net zero by about the middle of the century. But the, uh, but that's not the end point. Um, any of the the pathways that have us keeping below one point five degrees, you know, they they sit below zero <laughs> for the rest of the century and beyond. So point one is that net zero is not not the end the end point. Point two is that. I think net zero is has been really helpful um, because it has, you know, made a very clear signal that we are on a pathway to the elimination of fossil fuels as a sort, you know, as a key source of, of, of our energy and looking for alternatives. It, and, and I think that's been very helpful. Um, when we previously had in this country, 80% reductions, you could always pretend you're in the 20% that didn't count. It makes it really clear that we all have to be on that pathway. But point three is that we've got to be really careful about the net bit because the just as previously, people might be able to pretend they were in the 20%, you, you know, it, the numbers have to add up and we can't all be doing everything by offsetting our emissions because they're in enough places to offset them. Um, if everyone does that. And so, uh, you know, where there needs to be credible plans, uh, then I think those credible plans absolutely have to be credible plans for absolute zero in terms of emissions. You're really using offsetting as, uh, you know, for the cases where there simply are no alternatives. Thanks. Uh, Becky? Yeah, I mean, to follow up that point on the uh, potential exploitation of the net in net zero, um, I mean, just, just to backtrack, Louise, you said, are, are these targets sort of ambitious, too ambitious? I mean, that's kind of a non-debate because that's just what we've got to do. I mean, you know, in Bill McKibben's famous phrase, I think it was Bill McKibben, uh, you can't negotiate with physics, right? <laughs> um, we've we've got to get it done. And if, you know, the less we get done, the worse the outcomes will be. Conversely, the more we get done, the better. Um, so, um, you know, on the net, in net zero, it makes absolute sense at a global level, um, you know, because that's how the global carbon cycle works, right? If we can suck it out of the atmosphere by natural or artificial means, then it no longer causes a problem. Perfect sense at a global level. It makes slightly less sense as a country at a country level because then you get more wiggle room. <laughs> um, you know, the, 
Climate Change Committee in this country have made clear that they don't think that offsets from overseas should count towards our target. That was a strong uh, marker in the sand. But even so, there's ways that you can basically, you know, work it at, at national level. And at a company level, I am deeply worried about abuse of the net zero language. I mean, when you see, you know, oil companies claiming a net zero pathway i mean you know and 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 when you see uh, the government imposing a net zero test for future high carbon um, hydrocarbon extraction you know show me a net zero test for hydrocarbon extraction and i show you a really rubbish test basically i mean you know we've we've got to be much more upfront about this so i uh, myself and a team at lancaster did some work on um what policy and government governance you could have for um, carbon removal, which is the net in net zero. And at the very least, what you need to do is separate out targets and policies for carbon removal compared or greenhouse gas removal, I should say, compared to greenhouse gas reduction. So um, if, if companies want a net zero pledge, and this is something I think that should be asked of companies, um, if companies make a net zero pledge, it should be absolutely clear what percentage of that is coming from greenhouse gas reduction and what percentage of it is coming from um, removals and obviously a clear plan for those removals not offset schemes bought in other countries and that idea of separation of removals and reductions is really simple and it would solve it but the reason it doesn't happen is because that's where all the politics lies <laughs> Um, so, you know, we wrote this article saying we should have separation and everyone goes, yeah, great idea. Let's do it. But, you know, if that happened, it would be because we had cracked the politics. Yeah. Marion, from a um, practical point of view, you talked about how you thought that for, for, for some industries and some processes, there were always going to be some emissions so that you did need to do offsetting or, or capture or, or, or whatever. Is, is, that, is that real or is that just wiggle room? No, so look, if I look at our plans, at the moment we produce one and a half to two tonnes of CO2 per tonne that we're um, sort of creating in terms of metal and that the plan is to get that down to 0 0.3 tonnes per tonne by 2030. So that's a real ambitious, significant target. We're gonna to have to work very hard. We're gonna to have to get policymakers on side. We're gonna to have to collaborate with others in the industry. Um, but there is still gonna be that 0.3 tons per ton at the end. Um, now to Emily's point, that's not the end and, and we'll still be working hard to, to reduce that further. But I think it's a case of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So I absolutely agree with Becky that we need to be very clear that it's not just a case of putting some fluffy wording around offsets and you know it'll all be fine and we just carry on doing what we're doing that's not going to work but i think realistically there are going to be areas where for example competitively priced zero carbon electricity just isn't available within the time scales that we need it to be and so we are going to have to scale up um storage for carbon um before 2050 and that that is going to have to be a, a solution that's thought about but it's not a panacea and it doesn't take the place of genuine carbon reduction activities that are going to be needed. Mm -hmm. Can I just and come I back on really that? Like the, sorry, I was just going to. I was just going to say I really like the idea of um, separating it out, but also looking at where it makes sense. So, from a global perspective, yes, net zero is sort of the right target. And I think from an investor perspective, aligning your portfolio with a net zero outcome is probably okay. But when you're going down to company level and you're assessing the businesses in which you operate, then I think it's really, really important to look at how realistic and achievable those carbon offsets that are baked into their plan are likely to be. Yeah, Becky. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I agree. And I think, you know, Marion, the example you just gave is a really good one where, you know, that's exactly what you'd want to see where you look at, you know, doing absolutely everything you can do to take you know, nearly everything out of, of, of greenhouse gases out of the picture. And then you look at removals for the rest. And when I when I was part of the team that did this work about removals, we actually wanted to make it really clear that we are not against <laughs> rem, uh, investment in, uh, in, in removals technologies. They are absolutely crucial. Um, but the um and, and in fact we worked with a lot of carbon removal of, of greenhouse gas removal companies 
Um, and uh, from their point of view, they some of them would actually quite like to see this sort of separation because the you know greenhouse gas removals are a different sort of beast to uh, reduction. They need separate um separate policies it's a different sort of investment profile and so actually it does no service to them to sort of lump them into a general kind of uh you know we'll reduce when we can but we might offset thing my worry is that if you have too much focus or too much um too much focus or promise on removals it actually um it, you know almost culturally gives us a kind of like oh that's all right then we don't need to worry about it and you know we called this in our project mitigation deterrence that actually if all of the attention is on uh, removals and not reduction that it actually deters uh, mitigation through greenhouse gas reduction which you know is still the fastest cheapest most socially beneficial way of achieving the changes we need thank you there's there's two other issues i'd like to bring up in terms of net zero and the first one is the whole scope thing and i think this gets at the point that globally net zero is right but what does it mean for an individual country or particularly an individual organization to be net zero because if you look at a country for example a lot of people say that we in the uk are essentially exporting or sorry outsourcing our emissions to other countries sort of where the manufacturing is done and so on and for an organization there's the supply chain coming in how do you account for that? Do you insist that that's net zero? And more relevantly for some industries, I'm looking at you oil companies here, you've got the uh, sort of consumer chain going out. You know, this is the point that if you're extracting and refining a whole lot of fossil fuels, but you do that in a vaguely net zero way, but then you put those fossil fuels out into the market, does that really count as net zero? And, and this is one of the big sources of ambiguity. Where does everything get tracked back to? Who's, who's accountable for all this? Um, any comments, anybody on this? Uh, do you want me to go first again? Yeah, yeah why, not, why not? I, I mean, clearly, you know, scope three emissions in the, in the, in the language. I mean, clearly, um, you know, we do absolutely need to look at, uh, you know, em emissions that arise through supply chains and all the wider activities um, of any um, business or organisation. And it's difficult to do that. Um, and I, I mean, I think that, you know, there's certainly discussions within the TCFD framework about, um, you know, starting to report and disclose on those um, broader sets of of emissions and I you know I hope that um, it, as that's uh, increasingly focused upon then we'll start to you know start to put in place some of the technologies actually that enable the tracking and calculation of what those broader emissions are and the reason it's so important comes back to the points that we were all making at the start about collaboration um, it's about it, the need to actually take a systems wide approach which means the supply chain wide approach to um, some of the uh, to, to, to all of these decarbonisation challenges and it's only by collaborating across uh, those sectors and in between you know, and, and uh, sorry along those supply chains and indeed across sectors that we'll be able to actually achieve this and that focus on that wider um, set of uh, uh, and context in which uh, any business is operating is essential in order to determine that and then to come back to some of the points that both Becky and Marion were making you know that that goes all the way down to the behavior of consumers and the way in which you know any businesses are interacting with their customers and consumers and citizens because this is just as much about uh you know that social context is inseparable um so i it's it's central mm -hmm. so just introducing another thing here reporting is is touted as as a big thing we've got ts tcfd all over the place it's um Certainly in the UK, a lot of most financial institutions are now having to do TSD, TCFD reporting um, because of the regulators, it's, there's legislation being introduced and so on. How important is reporting in actually driving behaviours? It's clearly in some sense important in seeing where we are, but do we think that it's going to drive behaviours at all? Marion, do you have any ideas on this? So I think there's some really positive uh, 
points that, that have come up from regulations and reporting and some really big concerns that I have around them as well. So the positives are that they've brought this right up the agenda. So investors can't anymore, you know, put this aside as a side issue and, it, you know, it's not, it's not a problem. So I think that that's great. Um, and there are some quite interesting reporting standards coming through. So the FRC's new stewardship code, I think, is a, is a really interesting one where people are doing much more qualitative rather than just the blunt quantitative metrics. Um, my concerns around it are that it could drive unintended behaviours or unintended consequences. So we were talking earlier about offsets. And if you are under pressure to reduce the carbon impact of your portfolio over a very short period of time, well, guess what? Um, you put some offsets in place and it, it makes a big difference. And so, you know, it, there isn't anything currently which makes that distinction between whether you're actually investing in a, a way that's aligned with net zero or whether you've just reduced the, the carbon intensity of your portfolio through offsets. Um, so I think we just need to be very careful about the, the way that those reporting requirements might drive some short term behaviors which are not actually aligned with the transition. I think also. You know, there is this question around time horizon. So, you know, again, if you're, if you're trying to do something quickly, you might divest from companies which actually could be the drivers of the transition. And if you could engage with those companies in which you invest um, and spend some time helping to drive them towards a more sustainable future, that may well deliver better outcomes in the longer term than divesting from them altogether, but it, it may just not look quite as good on a, a tick box report. So, you know, I think the reporting's good and it's it's really important to focus the mind, but then I think the way in which we re react and respond to the metrics that we're seeing um, is very important and perhaps more nuanced. Thanks. You mentioned time horizons there, and that's really important because we know we've got to make massive reductions in emissions over the next, um, eight to nine years this decade and then keep on doing so till 2050 but it's very easy for people to well we see a lot of it that people say oh net zero by 2050 and you kind of get the impression that they're going to get there in 2049 and just carry on as normal up until then which is clearly um not helpful and 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 is, isn't going to do us any good should we be focusing on Shall we be thinking about postponing emissions? So if you if you can do something without emitting now, but it may mean that you have to emit a bit more in 10, 20 years time, should we say, look, just cut it now and we'll cope with the 10, 20 years time when we get to it, because maybe we'll have developed ways of, of handling it. Or should we be saying, well, look, no, it doesn't matter. You've got to think of the long term. You've got to think of, of ways of cutting your long term emissions. Um, Becky, I, you've, you've been a bit quiet. That's my fault. I haven't asked you. Do you have any views on this? It's uncharacteristic of me. <laughs> so what you're describing is actually there's a really interesting report by some of Emily's colleagues at uh, Cambridge uh, who call themselves the use less or use less group mm -hmm. <laughs> um, who who take that approach directly. They look at the sectors, um, the, the, the sort of they're engineers so they look at the sort of uh innovation possibilities in each of the big emitting sectors and they say exactly what you suggest uh louise for aviation for example they say well look right now the only credible way of reducing demand from uh, of, of reducing emissions from aviation is by reducing demand right there's like you know there are no uh electric uh passenger planes there won't be for quite a long time so we have to focus entirely on on demand as a response demand reduction as a response until we can sort the technology now that's sort of very logical and engineering and i have a lot of sympathy for it it's also you know political Politically incredibly difficult. But um, what I would say on the time horizon thing is that, you know, we've all gone, we, we've all made great pains to point out how difficult and complex this is and how linked all this is and so on. Actually, what we need to be focusing on in the near term today is not doing things that take us in the wrong direction. <laughs> you know, that's a pretty simple test. Um, you know, 
uh, building coal mines takes us in the wrong direction. Um, a lot of road schemes take us in the wrong direction. Um, you know, and there are um, conversely anything that we can do, um, any infrastructure that we can provide now, which enable those behaviour changes. I'm talking, um, you know, walking and cycling infrastructure in cities. Um, I'm, I'm talking, um, you know, whatever shifts we can get to farming and land use as a result of, um, you know, new uh, new support for farmers having left the EU, all these kinds of things. They are immediate and quick wins. And the danger is that the climate uh the, the the climate imperative is not filtering is not infiltrating those conversations nearly as, as much as it needs to at the moment so i start from a you know relatively low base of saying let's not try and make the wrong decisions right now when there is an alternative better decision that we can make that's you know staring us in the face so so one way of looking at that is 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 don't worry too much about what the best best possible thing we can do is just make sure you do some good things now and rather than bad things now well yeah i mean you know it is sometimes it all looks very complicated and you know what it comes down to is we need to um stop using fossil fuels we need to stop burning fossil fuels we need to change our land use um we need to remove uh the greenhouse gases that we really can't get rid of in any other way and obviously we need to prepare for the climate shocks upon us it's only four things right <laughs> i mean four huge things but it's actually pretty simple and and i i once i got sort of slightly obsessed with this and i i um and it's in it's in my book i ended up writing 10 things so uh, you know because i focus on government this is government focus not policy but i wrote a, a, a generic government climate strategy it only had 10 things on them it was those four sort of you know developed a bit i'll put a link to it on a blog um uh, but uh you know sometimes we overcomplicate things with really complicated sort of rules and procedures and and um you know toolkits and whatever and we forget that it's actually uh, you know, it, it's actually relatively simple and stark what we need to do. Yeah, thanks, uh, Emily. No, I was. I mean, so from the from the science perspective, it's this is relatively straightforward. So, what the climate responds to is the total amount of carbon that you put up into the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. And so, what counts is the you know, if you have a pathway of emissions, what counts is the area underneath that pathway. So if you go, if you try to think that you're going to be able to continue emissions as you go as, as today and then suddenly plummet down to net zero in 2050, then not only is that completely infeasible, <laughs> um, but also it wouldn't get you the reduction that you need because the area under your curve is going to be too big. <laughs> right? So you need the full pathway. That's why we say halving emissions by um, uh, uh, 2030 and then net zero, um, because it's that that's you, now you can modify that slightly in a slightly different route, so long as that area underneath the curve stays the same. Um, and then in terms of the climate impact, you would have an equivalent climate impact. Some of those pathways, depending on exactly what um, uh, trajectory they take, are going to be more plausible, more feasible um, than others. And that's just the way that the numbers add up. Great. I mean, yeah, that's right. And uh, uh, given that many of the audience here are actuaries, we're all mathematicians, we should understand that argument, you would hope. Yeah, but Louise, I think we're, we're also... Um, and I, I say this as an actuary, we're also sort of lulled into this false sense of security that we have perfect models and perfect data. And, and when we're looking at financial systems, we can, you know, we're all very comfortable with the, the model and the boundaries and parameters that we're using. And unfortunately, the, the sort of problems that we're dealing with here don't fit neatly into those models. And there is a great deal of uncertainty around that. And I have seen that used as an excuse to not start and not get involved because we can't quite work out exactly what the right answer is. Um, so, you know, to Becky's point, just get started and the data will evolve and the number that you have today probably isn't the perfectly right number uh, and what you're reporting against may not be calculated in the perfectly right way. Uh, but, you know, get a feel for the scale of the problem for where you're trying to get to and then start to take some steps in, in the right direction, because if we all sit in a navel gaze and try to work out the perfect way of calculating our pathway towards this end objective. The time is, is gonna have passed us by to get there. 
And there is, uh, if I can just come in, I, I, I agree very much with that. And there is actually a real politic here that we need to be aware of. And it is that those, um, you know, those complexities and not having quite as much data as we need and so on, those kinds of things are exploited ruthlessly by people and companies who want to keep emitting carbon. And I'd really recommend um, some work. I mean, this is this is academic research um, from a team who have basically categorised the various discourses of delay uh, that companies and countries and sometimes individual people use as a reason so you know broadly you can't deny the science anymore right so you have to say yes yes you know I'm fully behind net zero it's just that I'm not going to do it just yet because of you know reason one two three four five not quite enough information yet um, you know, it's to expect, you know, there's, there's basically they've catalogued these discourses of delay. And I think from, you know, the point of view of anyone involved in 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 assessing or managing or modelling risk, it's it's really important to be. Uh, and, you know, I speak as a social scientist, so this is sort of my bread and butter. It's really important to be aware of the motivations behind um, statements by companies and thinking, you know, is it basically asking the question, is this a, a genuine, um, you know, hurdle that we have to face or is this actually a discourse of delay, a, a, an excuse for doing nothing? Yeah, um, I'm going to try and move to some of the questions that have come in. Um, Nick Spencer's got an interesting one. Given some economic activities will not be zeroable, I'm not quite sure that's a valid word, but never mind. When do we need to start the conversation on where should greenhouse gas emissions be allowed and how we price them or allocate the sort of feasible budget of these emissions between different parties? So this actually sounds like partly a, a sort of government policy type thing. So I'll go to Becky first, but then um, pick up from other people. Well, I think this is relatively easy to do if you assume a sort of, you know, rational, uh, <laughs> expert led um, decarbonisation pathway. And in fact, the Climate Change Committee do do this. So basically, uh, you know, the crude version of it is any any <coughs> service that we need that can be decarbonized, you have to decarbonize that completely. Don't rely on removals or offsets for that sector. So that's now the case with electricity. It's increasingly the case with uh, transport, definitely passenger transport, less so freight. Um, you know, and, and the Climate Change Committee, they wouldn't put it quite this crudely, but they basically say for the UK, the things where you, you, you know, where you can't, uh, you, we need removals basically for aviation and agriculture. Um, there's a few other sort of slightly um, unclear sectors. So, you know, it, steel, the pathway isn't 100% clear yet, but we know we can produce steel without carbon. And Marion, you can, you, can, um, you can qualify that, but, you know, the technology exists, right, even if it is expensive. So... So that's 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 you know a very crude picture, um, and and you know I I, I think if I was <laughs> if I was you know minister in charge of this I would be sending really clear signals that those are the you know the only the sectors where there is no technology where there is no zero carbon alternative those are the only areas where I think removals should be um, should be uh, facilitated. Thanks. Are there the other two you want to come in on this? I mean, I can comment a little bit. I mean, I, some of this is just poli poli very political, right? Um, yeah. But um, I, I mean, I do think that some of the separation points that um, Becky has made previously are helpful here. And I think this, the conversation is starting to evolve very much in, in that direction, especially around um, some aspects of offsets. So um, where, you know, if offsets where you really are you know geologically storing the carbon away without any potential for leakage or anything else out of the system um you, you know you, you there are challenges as to you know this the amount of that that can be done but nevertheless at least you know you that is a genuine net zero um 
there are other offsets where there are you know, many more issues in terms of leakage and so forth, um, but there are all sorts of other benefits, a lot of the nature-based solutions, there are a lot of other benefits, one wouldn't want to be you know, ruling those out because of that broader context of the in which those are sitting. And so I, the language that's starting to be developed is around thinking about um, some things that are genuine removals and other things where you might be wanting to use them to compensate for past emissions that you've that you've made so actually broadening out the definition of of net zero to have you know some representation for of the of the emissions that you're making over the course of that pathway and, and historically as well so it feels as though actually there's we're actually in a little bit of a stage where some of these issues you know they're complicated they're complex but i think that we're starting to make progress on some of them in terms of thinking through the frameworks um, for actually um, being able to come up with a coherent language more than anything else to help inform how we um, how we're transparent about this. Yeah, and I think it's it's that framework based approach because I don't think you can say, you know, yes, this is allowed or no, that's not allowed. And I, I think it's really interesting that kind of um, some of the carbon capture solutions, the point Emily made there around actually some of them have other benefits as well and some biodiversity benefits too. So. You know, one example is um, we've started regenerating peatland in some of our Scottish sites, which holds about 100 kilograms of carbon per meter cube. So really effective way of capturing and, and dealing with carbon. Um, but obviously that, you know, if we covered all the land in Scotland in peat, it wouldn't solve the whole problem. So it's just being clear around, you know, what is that residual amount going to be and, and what do we need in terms of those technologies to capture it? Um, and to Becky's point, how do we separate out, you know, where there are industries where actually just try a bit harder and where there are some where it's just not going to be feasible and then we need to think about what the solution for those are. So um, Sam Gutterman is saying, how can we, given that most companies can't implement negative emissions, um, you know, they're going to have to use offsetting in some ways, um, how can we further encourage discussion and actions towards improving the offsetting mechanisms, which I think gets to partly what you were saying. I mean, there's, there's tax incentives. So Sam's, I know, in the US, and he's saying there are some tax incentives on sequestration, but certainly enough, not enough. Are, are um, monetary incentives or penalties, are they the, the right tool to use? Or should we be looking at more sort of softer um, you know, sort of behavioral encouragements and, and those sorts of things. Um, I hate to say holistic, but it's what it's what Emily touched on earlier with the five eyes. Um, we're going to have to have policy, monetary uh, pressure from consumers. It, it's going to have to be sort of a much more holistic view rather than just saying it's going to be one thing or the other. That's mm -hmm, gonna solve mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're I think we're pretty much all agreed on that. So thanks for that question, Sam. Um, looking up, we sorry, we've done that one. I'm just going through some of the questions. There's quite a lot of questions coming in, so I'm afraid we're not going to get to all of them. Um, what are some of the societal implications going to be? Do we have any idea? Um, are there going to be are people going to be um, have to accept? restrictions to some of their current freedoms, for example. Um, are there sort of bigger societal changes like that? That's probably one for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, I, 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 th I think it's really problematic to get uh, drawn into an argument that's framed as we are free at the moment, we need to be more restricted to tackle climate change you know you uh, i mean um, i'm going to hit you with some social science jargon for which i apologize but uh, you know uh, um, you can see the way we live our lives the way society works is made up of what you might call socio-material systems that's the social science jargon sorry the idea is that you can see, um, you know, you can see our society is made up of, you know, a mobility system, which is not only how we travel, but why we travel. 
um, you know, a, a, a food system, which is, you know, what we eat and how it's produced and so on. And within those different systems, there are all sorts of um, uh, uh, bits of infrastructure, investment, behaviour and so on. So, and, and one of the main determinants of that system is uh, government policy and regulation, right? If you look at transport, for example, it's a heavily regulated sector. You think about, you know, fuel tax, um, how buses are regulated, you know, everything to do with the mobility system is shaped by government and obviously um, the and, and government sets the incentives to which um, which uh, companies and people respond to. So, I mean, sorry for that sort of slight <laughs> sociology lecture, but the the point of that is. It's not like we're free to make whatever transport choices we want now, right? <laughs> you know, it is a conditioned transport system and we can change that system. It's within our power to change that system to get better social outcomes um, and better, better climate outcomes. I'd even go so far as to say better freedom outcomes, <laughs> however, what you, however you want to define that. I mean, you know, rural families in poverty spend a huge, I don't know the latest figures, once I looked and it was 25% of their disposable income on running a car, right? That's not freedom, is it? <laughs> so I would say reject that language to start with and think about, you know, very a very positive discussion about how we can actively shape those systems um, to give people the lives they want um, with, um, with no carbon. Uh, Emily. Um, yeah, so I think we've seen during the pandemic, and we also saw coming out of some of the citizens assemblies that um, Becky has been involved in, a key concept, which is that people are prepared to do their bit if they think that what they're being asked to do is fair. Um, and, uh, you know, that 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 fairness is going to be absolutely critical to whether or not we have a successful net zero transition or not. And a key way of uh, ensuring that things are fair is to involve people in the decision making around it. Not only does that help root the fairness and the just transition um, into the decision making processes, but it also makes those decisions better because we're bringing in more innovative ideas into the process. Um, so I think those two things are absolutely central to this fairness and involving people in the decision making. Yes, I, I, I hope that no one would um, disagree with that. Um, sorry, there's still more questions coming in. Um, we, we've talked about net zero by 2050 seeming like a very binary target. We talked about needing to show the pathway to net zero and beyond. Um, and the ease of, of trying to postpone things by, you know, if you've just got to do it by 2050, well, 2049 is good enough. Um, do we need to be a bit more granular than that? So we have the sort of 2030 aim and then a 2050 aim. Do we need to go even more granular than that? Do we need to think in terms of um, maybe annual milestones? Yeah, I, I don't know how, how useful annual milestones are, but, but it could be useful. What I, I think... 2050 is far too long term. And I think if you take it down um, to company level, it's really important that there are some staging posts and some scientific based targets on when those staging posts are going to be reached um, and some real detail around what's the business case behind that, what's the technology readiness for, you know, what you're relying on to hit those targets so that people can assess whether that's realistic or, or whether more needs to be done. And it's not to say that it'll happen in a straight line to Emily's point about the sort of area under the curve. Um, it may be that actually, whilst some technologies are developed, you're transitioning and then transforming. Um, but, but understanding that and being quite open and transparent about it, I think is very important. Can I, can I add one thing in here? Because we took, we, uh, actually to go back to the point that I made right at the start of my initial introduction, we're focusing rightly uh, significantly on pathways to um, to net zero, um, but we do also need to focus on the adaptation and building resilience side of things as well. Earlier this year, um, there was the National Climate Change Risk Assessment um, produced, and you know one of the key headlines was just how lamentable the amount of planning currently there is in terms of that adaptation and resilience building. So these two things need to come in 
you know, in parallel, we need to be absolutely focused on emissions reductions, but we do also need to be looking at adaptation and building resilience as well. And I have a clear plan for both of them. So that, that's great. And I, what I'd like to do now is, as we sort of move towards a close, is to think about actuaries in particular. We've got a, session, a webinar in this series coming up, um, I think, next week or the week after next on what insurers can do, what insurers should be doing as a positive thing to encourage and support action. Um, so one of the things is what products can they develop in order to, to support adaptation in particular, but also mit mit mitigation. So if we leave that aside, what should individual actuaries or the what should we be doing as actuaries? Should we be focusing on analyzing what's going on so that we help with the sort of information gap? Should we be focusing on trying to influence the financial system? Should we be focused on cutting our individual carbon consumption? What are, what are ways that we as actuaries can help? Um, maybe I'll go with Marion first because she, she's got a sort of closer view of, of actuaries, but to give Emily and Rebecca time to think. So if I think of where actuaries kind of sit on this, um, they are trusted advisors to investors that control hundreds of millions and, and billions of pounds worth of assets. And I think where capital flows go is going to be crucial to determining the path of, of this transition. So. I think really just raising awareness with clients on the scale of the problem and what needs to be done and where the investment opportunities are to improve that, I think is, is important. I think in, in describing risk, we have a role. So again, just translating what we've talked about today as a very broad set of issues and uncertainties uh, and risks into something that's understandable for the particular context in which their clients are operating and can be then translated into action so that they don't get overwhelmed by, you know, things that we talked about earlier, lack of data, not, not enough information, et cetera. Um, and then I think as well, we have a role with policymakers, again, to translate, you know, what are some of the consequences that might come? Because we do have a good platform without, you know, necessarily a specific agenda um, or tied to a, a kind of corporate plan or, or whatever, where we can actually say, what are some of the policy decisions that might start helping this flow of capital go to the right place? Thanks. Um, Becky. Yeah, so I, I feel drastically unqualified to, um, <laughs> to be saying what actuaries should be doing. Um, so uh, thank you, Marion, for saving me that, that task. But I think, you know, more generally, what I think anyone should be doing in a professional role and you know that includes me as a you know in the university it actually includes me in you know other roles in life in terms of being a parent at kids in school or whatever is to ask the questions to speak up about climate change to acknowledge it as a material consideration um to question the assumptions that are being made. It goes back to what I was saying at the beginning about, you know, the irrationality of rational expectations. Are we, you know, if if someone says something or you see a report which is just assuming this eternal present, well, we need to be we need to be challenging that. Um, and I think sometimes the reason that people don't is because it feels socially awkward. So I did a fascinating interview set with uh, members of parliament about why, you know, the extent to which they uh, raise climate issues. And admittedly, this was a few years ago, it might be different now, but one of the reasons they didn't raise it is because they didn't want to, they didn't want to stand out. They didn't want to be marked as a sort of, you know, weirdo, greeny, whatever. Um, and the same is true in all professions, I think. It's it's really difficult to, to stand out and say stuff which is seen as sort of a little bit against the grain, but it's absolutely necessary. And that's the way that change happens. Emily. So, yeah, so, I mean, kind of building on what Marion said, uh, to my mind, one of the biggest challenges that hasn't been, you know, at all addressed yet is how to unlock 
private finance. And and I think that, you know, if if um, the actuaries can be a key part of both shaping the products and services that are associated with de-risking that uh, that that finance, um, helping to um, inform and uh, and frankly to lobby for what the appropriate policies ought to be associated with this you know the government's coming out with a net zero review Rishi Sunak ought to be having this as being number one of his agenda and I don't think it currently is um, and um, and I you know and then also putting in place the institutions and uh, to help facilitate that, I, you know, the Green Finance Institute is doing really great things, but it's a tiny organization and we need to have that sort of innovative thinking um, happening at a large scale, not at a small scale um, in this country and indeed globally. It's an area where, you know, we, we do lead the world in terms of financial services. This is, you know, if we could really get this right, we could be, it could be an example where we were really demonstrating global leadership and making you know so much more of a difference um, than we than we currently are but it needs to have financially literate people really helping inf inform the policy de debate and shaping the institutions which are going to be the critical institutions for the coming decades i think this is a really important point we have to normalise, this isn't my idea, um, uh, Catherine Hayhoe has been very prominent in putting forward this, we have to normalise the discussion of the problem. We have to make it normal to be concerned about climate change and to think about how to solve it, rather than being something just for Birkenstock wearing lentil eating tree huggers. So, you know, and it, something we can all do is bring is to start the conversations with everybody, with our families, yes, but I think as actuaries, we can also do it at work. However junior you are, you can always ask questions. You can say, why are we making this assumption? Or should we be thinking about the impacts of climate change? And eventually it will become normal for people to expect to be asked those questions and to be thinking about the answers. And I think this is a really important thing. And it won't take as long as, I mean, it's not, it is a bit of a drip drip thing, but if we get down there and do it, it's not gonna take another 20 years. I think we've, we've seen how social attitudes can change quite rapidly. So that's certainly something we can all do and should be doing. Um, Emily, I know you have to dash off. Is there, are there any sort of final points you'd like to make? Um, well, no, I mean, you know, within the weeks running up to COP26 in Glasgow, and, you know, it is a critical moment for the world. So we, we really all, I think, need to be crossing our fingers and hoping for a successful outcome. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks very much, Emily. Um, I'll just sort of continue a bit with um, Marion and, and Becky. Um, what should, and, and this is a, a sort of society and insurance thing. If there's a lot of pressure on insurers, for example, to stop underwriting, um, to stop insuring um, environmentally damaging activities such as extracting thermal coal and, and all that. If that's leaving people unprotected, because it means that the, um, for example, the uh, liability risks of the thermal coal extractors are no longer covered so that if they have a big pollution incident, there's no one who's going to pay to pick up the costs. It, what should we do about that balance between trying to um, have a direct impact on some of the actors in here and thinking about protecting wider society, especially in an area like insurance? And investment is, is partly the same, um, where, where you've got this a bit of a trade-off. Marion. Thank you, Louise, for that hospital past. Um, <laughs> I just thought it was an interesting question no, that really, came up. It's a really interesting question, and there's unfortunately no easy answer to that. I think, um, and it, it is a similar link to the investment point around, you can divest from this and translate it to insurance. You can refuse to underwrite it, and then you walk away, and it's not your problem, and it makes it a bit more difficult for that company to get insurance, and maybe they don't get insurance. But it can result in disastrous outcomes for the communities around that particular organization. And so I think there is a real argument for engagement rather than sort of stopping providing services. And that engagement can be carrot and stick. So the stick can be very high costs. 
Um, it can be the threat of divestment or, or taking away the opportunity to be insured. But actually, I think there's quite a lot that can be done working with all those organizations to say, how do we get this on a more aligned path? And then how can we sensibly wind down our exposure to those types of assets or, or mm -hmm. liability risks? Mm -hmm. Becky, do you have any, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a sort of actuarial question, but given the people aspect, I, I wondered if you had any thoughts of it. Well, I think, I think more generally, I mean, let me link this to another question which we haven't answered yet, which was Tim Webb saying, um, you know, what about requiring all new homes to use, basically not to use gas or stopping selling diesel cars? Um, when you're talking about the changes that are needed, the, the really crucial thing, and I think this implies to the, this applies to the insurance question as well, is um, is signalling the direction that you're going in. So I actually think that this government's probably got it about right on the shift to EVs. They've said that you know you won't, they won't be, it won't be, you won't be able to sell um, petrol and diesel cars after 2030. I think they're wrong on hybrids. That's a sort of side issue, but basically that gives the industry a really clear signal and um, time to adjust. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, the, the trouble is that it's in most areas, it isn't at all that clear. I think, you know, insurance companies could do the same. They could make it really clear who they will and won't insure and, you know, set that expectation over a time to give companies time to adjust. Um, I can't really comment on those sort of legacy issues because they're just not my expertise. Um, I think that um, it is, though, all those sort of the, the companies that provide those sorts of services to corporates. I mean, I think, you know, another um, example from being embroiled in the coal mine discussion is that the, the mining company said that they would offset some of their emissions from the site using gold standard certified offsets. And I think very bravely, the gold standard um, company or organization, whoever it is that, that that verifies, you know, provides that gold standard verification, said that they didn't, they, they didn't, they, that they wouldn't um, provide certification for a coal mine because its job is to dig coal out of the ground. And I think that was a really important and principled stand. And uh, more of that, please. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we're coming to an end. And I'd just like to ask both of you if you have any final points you'd like to make. I mean, there's such a huge area and we've only been able to touch, scratch the surface, really. Um, Becky, any final messages that you'd like to convey? I think, um, you know, it's a bit like what I was saying earlier about the hugeness and complexity and difficulty of this debate. It is huge and complex and difficult, but it's also very fast changing and it has honestly the amount of political and uh, corporate and public attention that there is now on climate change compared to even three years ago despite a global pandemic is incredible actually and heartening so I, by saying that, I am not at all complacent. Of course, I'm not complacent, but things can change quickly, just like there are sort of, uh, you know, threshold events in the climate system or tipping points. So there are, I think, in, in, in political systems and in, you know, our ways of thinking about these things culturally and in the way that companies work. So, you know, that's what gives me hope. I think the pace of change is absolutely, um, you know, is 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 incredible now it's not as fast as it needs to be but uh, you know i just leave you with that thought that i i never would have thought uh, sort of four years ago that there would be such huge attention on it as there is now yeah marion uh, i think thinking about the audience um, as a group of predominantly trees my message would be to grasp this um and, and a real call to action so this is one of the key risks, but also the key opportunities of our time and getting a clear understanding of the exposures and the opportunities that, that this presents for you and your clients could really meaningfully change the outcome for both your clients and also society. So I suppose our message is to get involved in, and to upskill yourself as much as possible in this area, because it is really important. Thanks, Marion. Great. I don't have to say that bit now, so, which is fantastic. <laughs>
<laughs> so I'd like to thank um, Emily, Becky and Marion for their um, fantastic contributions to our discussion. It's been a great discussion. Um, thank you to um, our sponsors, our platinum sponsor Milliman and our sponsor Star Actuarial Futures Limited for their support. Um, we've got our next event is on Tuesday at 3.30 UK time, when we're going to be looking at climate justice and intergenerational fairness. I'll be joined by Jane Davidson, who's Pro Vice Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, and author of Future Gen. Kutsai Chigiji, who's an IFOA fellow and founder of Africans Thinking and Alice bordini Starden of the Intergenerational Foundation to discuss how the climate crisis is increasingly being analyzed through the lens of intergenerational fairness, which is obviously a long-standing um, uh, area of, 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 of um, thought for actuaries. So as always, you can register for this event on the events page on the IFOA website. So, Thanks very much to everybody. There is a QR code on the screen, which you can give us feedback. Feedback, always welcome. I'm sorry I couldn't, we couldn't get to so many of the questions, of which there were a lot, um, but maybe you can um, think about them and um, discuss them sort of with, with friends and colleagues. Remember to try and talk about this to as many people as you can to try and normalize the discussion and as actuaries ask questions and question assumptions. So thanks very much to Marianne, Becky and Emily. And thanks also, of course, to the um, IFO executive for their support in putting this event on. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Louise.